Okay. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so every decade, an opportunity to create massive wealth presents itself. I remember when I was a teenager and my father used to buy kind of Intel and Microsoft stocks and he was glued to his computer, going crazy, looking for the next kind of IPO out there. And, uh, and unfortunately, eventually, we, we lost most of our profits from that. About 10 years later, uh, the year was 2007, and I got hired uh, to be a trader and analyst at Avenue Capital, which is a hedge fund uh, that invests in distressed assets. And I was responsible to uh, basically to buy financial companies in distress. And so I was kind of lucky enough to buy companies like AIG, Bank of America, Citigroup at the bottom and kind of watch them grow throughout the year and, and make massive profits for investors that invested in them. And, uh, and in fact, I was invited today to speak about the blockchain, which I feel is kind of the next uh, very big paradigm shift in the world and in technology. And so I'm very excited to kind of talk to you about it. And I hope that following this talk, at least some of you will feel that you, you got something out of it and learned something, at least about how investors are, are thinking about this asset class. So first of all, what is blockchain? Before maybe I continue, maybe with a show of hands, who here has invested in blockchain assets? Okay, okay, great. Is there anybody here that hasn't invested in blockchain assets? Okay, so I'll try to make it very quickly what, what a blockchain is. Um, a blockchain is basically a distributed, immutable ledger that is decentralized, that allows us to transact with each other and exchange value with no intermediary in the middle between us and basically for free. Um, imagine kind of the situation we're in today. Let's say we're part of a community and this community has a bank. The bank basically keeps track of all the transactions that we make with each other. I transacted with Orr, I sent her money, the bank holds the Excel spreadsheet and, and writes it down. Now, this paradigm forces us to basically trust the banks and rely on their solvency. And what happened in 2009, that as a result of the financial crisis, a white paper was published by Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, which basically created a protocol which enables a decentralized medium of exchange. So let's imagine for a second that we want kind of to create a decentralized system for us to transact. So instead of having a bank that's responsible for our finances, the community actually decides to, uh, to manage uh, the money collectively. We have a shared Google spreadsheet. Everybody can go in and make changes whenever there's a transaction. The community comes together and verifies the transaction. Okay, so there's a couple of issues with this, right? First of all, privacy. I don't want people to know that I, that I gave money to, a, to Aura, right? Um, it's, my, it's my personal information. The other issue with this is efficiency. Why, if, if I have a full-time job and other people in my community have a full-time job, it doesn't make sense for all of us to come together and verify transactions. The other issue is security. If we have a shared spreadsheet and everybody's making changes, how do we know that nobody's tampering with, with the spreadsheet? So, and this is where blockchain comes in and how blockchain deals with this problem. So first of all, in terms of privacy, instead of us having to kind of uh, transact with each other and everybody knowing our names, then we have addresses that, uh, that we own the private keys to and nobody knows who the address belongs to. The second issue about the efficiency, rather than us having to um, verify the transaction, we employ a group that their job is basically to, to verify the transactions. In blockchain world, it's called miners. Um, and in terms of security, rather than having one spreadsheet that's shared between us, the copy of the spreadsheet is actually on each one of our computers. And the other measure that's taken in order to make changes to this spreadsheet or to this ledger, the miners or the people basically that we employ to verify our transactions, they each go through a race to solve a riddle uh, in order to verify the transaction. And it actually takes them, it costs them real money and real computing power 
to solve this riddle. And, uh, and the first one who, who basically solves it is then verified by other people in the community. So he can't lie because if he's going to lie, other people in the community are going to catch on to him. And only then will this transaction be added to the ledger. And then the other ledgers of the rest of us in the community are updated. So in fact, theoretically, we can trust these miners or these people that we employed because they actually need to pay money in order to, uh, to accept the reward. So this is revolutionary, basically, because it allows us to interact with each other without needing to, to trust each other. So it's trustful and it's trustless. It's trustful because everything is accepted through consensus, and it's trustless because basically um, it's, governed by, it's governed by the code. So, so why is this significant to anything beside money? And this is where kind of smart contracts come in and the revolution of Ethereum. Someone told me the other day that the best th way to think about a smart contract is through, let's say Bitcoin is like Excel. So smart contracts are like the macro. And I, I actually thought it was genius. Of course, my team just thought I'm a crazy Excel geek. But basically, this is exactly this, the, the notion of programming something on our ledger. And uh, the program can be anything. I mean, it can be if money has been delivered, then ship this product. And once you think about all the applications that can be programmed on top of a ledger and on top of the blockchain, um, it's kind of, it's kind of mind-boggling. Um, the obvious suspects are, of course, financial organizations. But today, we're seeing industries across the world uh, adopting blockchain technologies to facilitate, uh, to facilitate transactions, to facilitate business. Now, the, the technology is still incredibly young. I mean, we, we haven't yet experienced uh, a real kind of killer application that was designed on the blockchain that really changed our lives. Uh, it's still extremely early. Uh, but I do think that kind of the next revolution of blockchain and the next level is going to be, is going to be exactly that. Uh, for example, one thing that's emerging is the concept of DAOs. DAOs are decentralized organizations. Imagine that instead of incorporating companies, we, have, uh, we, we organize uh, together with different people in the world, working towards specific projects, and all the governance and all the incentives and all the rewards are basically distributed and governed by, by code that we program. Uh, another example is IoT. Uh, in several years from now, we're going to be uh, part of a chip economy. We're going to see our items and our devices transacting on our behalf. And we're not that far away from the point in which our refrigerator is going to order groceries for us, our laundry machine is going to order detergent, our self-driving car is going to be able to go and refuel itself on its own. And all of this kind of technology requires a methodology to, to transact and, and to authenticate. And this is going to be uh, also most likely uh, created by the infrastructure of the blockchain. So all this sounds incredibly exciting, but what does it mean for us, for us investors and entrepreneurs? And how do we make uh, money for it? How do we raise funds for it if we're entrepreneurs? And uh, in order to understand uh, how this is done and how value is created in the blockchain, it's important, first of all, to appreciate the differences between internet and blockchain and how value gets distributed along the stack. So if you think about internet, traditionally, protocols such as HTTP, SSL, um, et cetera, these, these protocols weren't monetized directly, but rather the applications that were built on top of them, those were the ones that were monetized. For example, Facebook and Google. Facebook basically monetizes the sharing of con our sharing of content, our attention. And uh, theoretically, if you would think about a, a decentralized Facebook, then that value, rather than going to a centralized organization, theoretically should be going to the people who actually contribute this value, create the content, distribute it, share, etc. And in fact, if 
blockchain, uh, if models around kind of network, uh, network business models actually emerge, this can actually end up being an, an Achilles heel for, for companies like Facebook. Now in blockchain, the, the, the value within the stack is, is actually reversed, meaning that most of the value today at least is at the protocol layer. And, uh, the re and the way to think about it, I mean, even if you think about Bitcoin, for example, last I checked, market cap is about $200 billion. Ethereum market cap, $50 billion. Now the applications on Bitcoin aren't nearly as valuable. Same thing with Ethereum. The applications built on top of Ethereum aren't nearly as valuable. Now, why does this happen? So first of all, it happens because of the shared data layer. Everything is open source, so theoretically, everybody can, can see the information, whereas historically on the internet, in centralized organizations, all the data uh, is kept in the organization's hand. So once the data is shared, this lowers the barriers to entry and makes it much easier for people to enter the market. The other reason for that is the access token. The access token is basically the mechanism in which people can, can participate in the economy. So for Bitcoin, it's transacting in money. Uh, for Ethereum, it's computing power. For Filecoin, it's file storage, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these tokens, they have a speculative value because the people that adopt the technologies or the protocols early will actually benefit from the rise in the value of the tokens if this network gets adopted. So what this does is it drives entrepreneurs to, to buy the tokens. A lot of times it's people that are actually using uh, the technology, but in other times it's people that are just speculating. As these companies become successful, it creates a desire for more entrepreneurs to come in. Maybe entrepreneurs that made money investing in Ethereum will then want to use the money that they made to create applications on top of Ethereum because they know that if they generate adoption at the application layer, it will increase further value at the protocol layer. So this is in fact exactly how uh, in blockchain the protocols are fat and, application, uh, and the application layer is thin. And so as an investor, if you actually want to make money within the blockchain, you, uh, you actually do need to invest at the protocol layer as well. And this brings me to the next topic, ICOs. The way, uh, the way to create a protocol, the way for entrepreneurs to create a protocol today is and, and, and basically create adoption or raise money is through, is through a token generation event. Token generation event is an ICO, an initial coin offering, and it's been very hard to kind of ignore everything related to ICOs currently in the news. ICO is basically a phenomenon that combines crowdfunding, fintech, uh, network effects, all in one. And, uh, and what it does basically, it enables entrepreneurs to raise money from the crowd and, uh, and, and basically raise awareness and adoption to the protocol that they're trying to create. Uh, now recently in Q2 and Q3, the amount of ICOs or the amount of money raised for ICOs has surpassed the amount of money that were raised for, for blockchain startups. Um, and yet there is uh, a lot of excitement about it, but also a lot of volatility ahead. Uh, this volatility is coming from a lot of uncertainty in the market, lack of regulation. There are what we call Bitcoin whales. For example, one of the biggest issues today with Bitcoin is that 97% of the bitcoins are owned by 3% of the addresses. So just imagine one of these kind of big addresses or someone trying to off offload his bitcoin in the market, it can completely, uh, it can completely crash uh, the market cap. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of people that are using the excitement generated by these ICOs to uh, basically conduct fraud is incredibly unfortunate. In fact, last week, one of the ICOs, Confido, raised a million dollars and basically, uh, and basically took the money and ran and told everybody who participated in the ICO, we're very sorry, we needed the money, bye. Uh, so this obviously raises a lot of concerns and shows how much risk there is in, the, in this industry. Uh, 
But at the same time, there's also still a lot of upside. In terms of the adoption curve, we are still incredibly early. Like I said, we don't even yet have a DAP today that's actually changing our lives. Um, and so most of the upside and the wealth creation is still, uh, is still very much ahead of us. We do need to kind of learn from the lessons of, of the dot-com bubble. Um, if you remember back in the 90s, um, there was a significant crash, but the companies that actually remained have experienced incredible capital gains and, uh, and the monopolistic nature of their business. The way I deal with it actually, investing in the blockchain, is that each quarter I actually take out money from the system because Unfortunately, we can never time the market. If we're able to time the market, we would be incredibly rich. So every quarter, I just take money out of the system because we never know when we're going to experience a correction. And there will be a correction. So why, why invest in crypto assets? Uh, they're not correlated. They're not even correlated to each other. They present significant upside. Investment in crypto assets should be done in the context of, uh, of a wider portfolio. It should be something that you feel comfortable losing uh, because, like I said, it's incredibly risky. This is the daily expected returns of crypto assets just on the last uh, ten, uh, couple of years. So how do you invest in crypto assets? I mean, how do you look at an ICO? Now, you'll be surprised, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's incredibly similar to how you invest in a startup. You look for a team, you look for a technology, you look for a market, and it's really exactly the same. So how do you rise above the noise? Today we're coming out with about 50 ICOs each day. And the way we do it is we create a screening process. Um, the first thing I look at is, I look at the team. Is this a team that actually had achievements in their life? What did they accomplish in their life? Uh, do they have the grit to execute? The next thing I look at is the idea. Is there a real market for what they're trying to do? And a lot of times there is a market, but on the other hand, is there a blockchain fit? I mean, what, not everything is appropriate for the blockchain. There are many uh, companies today, centralized companies, that are creating value and doing it well. So this is also something we look at. Um, we look at whether there's a prototype. Today, I don't invest anymore in companies just based on the white paper. I want to look at the GitHub. I want to see that they're actually doing something, that they actually have a prototype in place. Um, very, very important to look at the token metrics. And again, this is exactly like investing in startups. You look at the valuation. Does the valuation make sense? How much money are they raising? Today, there are companies that might have extremely cool projects, but they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you can't really imagine what kind of demand would create appreciation within their price. And lastly, I look at the community. In blockchain, because everything is open source, everybody has access to the data. So the most important thing you're creating, the asset you're creating, is the community. It's the network effect. It's the adoption. Uh, and so once I kind of go through these five metrics, I will decide if, if I want to dig deeper. And this, by the way, takes me about five minutes before I actually decide to do uh, due diligence. We use this methodology to invest on iAngels and to invite investors to invest in iAngels. Actually met some people in the room that, uh, that uh, were exposed to some of our offerings. We recently made an investment in Quantstamp, which is a company that provides verification and auditing for smart contracts on the Ethereum platform. And so far, we're 3x since ICO last week. And, um, and so, indeed, it's very exciting times. Uh, with that, I'll kind of end, and I'll invite you to either sign up to iAngels at www.iangels.co, or reach out to me by email if you have any questions, if you're working on an interesting project, if you're looking to invest in something and you'd like an opinion. Uh, happy to stay in touch. Thank you very much. תודה רבה שלי על דברייך המרתקים ומעוררי ההשראה. כעת אני מתכבדת להזמין לבמה את הגברת מירב הראל, 
סמנכ"לית אופרציה בבנקור, שתרצה לנו בנושא כלכלות מקוונות. מירב מכהנת כ-COO של חברת בנקור.